Welcome to the Memorizing Pharmacology podcast. I'm Tony Guerra, pharmacist and author of the Memorizing Pharmacology book series, bringing you mnemonics, cases, and advice for succeeding in pharmacology. Sign up for the email list at memorizingpharm.com to get your free suffixes cheat sheet or find our mobile-friendly, self-paced online pharmacology review course at residency.teachable.com forward slash p forward slash mobile. Let's get started with the show. Okay, if you ran into this video before you ran into the anticholinergic bud cat, I recommend that you go to episode 62 and go check that out. Uh, but the cholinergic sludge cat is going to get us through the opposite effects of anticholinergic, anti-anti, uh, uh, and we're going to kind of make a U-turn here. So again, we are making a U-turn. We're going from anticholinergic to cholinergic. So many of the things that you'll see are somewhat familiar, but what we want to do is make sure that we have these clear in our head. So the first thing is to get the vocabulary clear. If something is cholinergic, it is also a muscarinic agonist. And this is our muscarin mushroom. And this is where it all began. So people use that as synonyms or use them interchangeably. Oh, that's cholinergic. Oh, that's muscarinic. They don't say this as much, but it also counts. It is parasympathomimetic, okay? So what were the opposites? Right, the opposite of cholinergic is anticholinergic. The opposite of muscarinic is anti-muscarinic or muscarinic antagonist. The opposite of parasympathomimetic is parasympatholytic. So let's kind of look at how we can use these opposites. So we learned Bud the Wide-Eyed Tachycardic Cat, how that gives us the anticholinergics. So let's go to the opposite, which is cholinergic crisis. That is, uh, we have way too much uh, cholinergic activity, too much acetylcholine. And what we'll do is we'll kind of take a look at our new cat. So our last cat was wide-eyed, in the desert, very dry. Our new cat, sludge cat, is in the water with pinpoint pupils and is a bit bradycardic. Okay, so the mnemonic itself, sludge, we'll get to, but the cat part is that it is a cholinergic, starts with C, agonist, begins with A, ends with T. All right, so here are the opposites. So on the left-hand side, we have Bud Cat from our anticholinergic presentation and blurry vision because of dry eyes, urinary retention, dry mouth or xerostomia, constipation, and hydrosis, which is a lack of sweat, and was tachycardic. So again, we have to say wide-eyed tachycardic Bud Cat because there is a B and a T in the mnemonic. And madriasis, again, is that wide-eyed, M-Y-D-R-I-A-S-I-S. -I now, you've probably seen the sludge mnemonic, but what I want to do is show you where it comes from. So the opposite of blurry vision, because of dry eyes, is lacrimation. Now, it starts with an L. Now, you're still blurry. It's just for a different reason. Before, it was because your eyes were so dry. Now, it's because your eyes are so wet. Urinary retention, the opposite is urinary incontinence. Dry mouth, the opposite is salivation, constipation, obviously the opposite is diarrhea, and hydrosis is sweating, and then the opposite of tachycardia is bradycardia. Now, to be fair, you will have initial tachycardia in the presentation, but it'll eventually go to bradycardia. And then meiosis, the pinpoint pupils, are the opposite of madriasis. So let's put those in the sludge order now and add the other pieces. So we saw the salivation, the lacrimation, urinary incontinence, and diarrhea. And then we have the GI cramping and emesis. So I have this crisis just ahead signpost with a big thunderstorm, lots of rain coming to remind you that sludge is sludge because it's so wet. Where does this come from? Well, cholinergic crisis can come from pesticides and organophosphates. So put a little 
chalkboard thing here, but uh, the idea is that, okay, where, where's someone going to get it? Okay, and it's going to be the farm. Okay. But we have two competing conditions. We have a myasthenic crisis and we have a cholinergic crisis. The issue is that both of them are going to look very similar on presentation, but one is because of low acetylcholine stimulation, and then the other is because of excess acetylcholine stimulation. So I have a question down at the bottom which explains it better, but we use an antibody test now which can let us know which it is. But why did edrophonium, an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, result in improvement in myasthenic crisis, but worsening of cholinergic crisis? Well, if edrophonium is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, capital A, capital C, little h, capital E, that means that it stops the breakdown of acetylcholine and there'll be more of it around. So we're basically adding acetylcholine. If we add acetylcholine to myasthenic crisis, where we have low acetylcholine, it makes sense that they're going to improve. It's actually the class of drugs we'll give, though this is not the one we'll give because that one only lasted a very short amount of time. However, if you are in cholinergic crisis and you give them more acetylcholine in addition, well, now you're in trouble. Now you're doing the wrong thing. So the reason we don't give it anymore is because, well, we were adding it and making it a little bit worse and we don't want to make it worse. So treatments on the myasthenic crisis side where we have too much acetylcholine, right? Too little acetylcholine, take it back. So myasthenic crisis, too little acetylcholine. We give an acetylcholine esterase, acetylcholine esterase inhibitor because what we want to do is have them have more acetylcholine. So we stop the breakdown. It's also a, an immune condition. So we give immunosuppressants, cyclosporin, azathioprine, steroids to suppress the immune attacking itself or the immune system attacking itself. On the cholinergic crisis side, we treat, we remove the acetylcholinesterase inhibitor and we provide ventilation if they need it, and then IV atropine. Why does IV atropine make sense? If you get that, then you know, you've gotten what I'm throwing down. Well, IV atropine makes sense because you had a situation where you have too much acetylcholine. Atropine is anti-cholinergic. So it goes against that acetylcholine. Okay. Let me give you a visual to make me make it a little more clear. So here's myasthenia. On the left is the normal neuromuscular junction. And then on the right, we have myasthenia with the antibodies against the receptor. And those antibodies are not letting acetylcholine get through. So the idea is we need more acetylcholine, but we don't do it directly. You don't say, here you go, here's some more acetylcholine, just the way that, you know, when we have certain conditions that in the blood-brain barrier, we just can't give dopamine, well, we have ways around it, okay? So what we do is we treat myasthenia gravis, which I call missing acetylcholine gravely. So just play on words to try to remember what the problem is by creating a situation where there will be more acetylcholine because we stop breaking it down. Okay. Uh, one of the more telling signs is this ptosis, P-T-O-S-I-S, -S, which is where the upper eyelid droops over the eye. Okay. All right. So let's move on to the symptoms. So myasthenia gravis symptoms, uh, the D's, because everything seems to start with D. So diplopia, double vision, drooping of one or both eyelids, difficulty swallowing, difficulty speaking, chewing, difficulty using your arms and hands and holding up your head because the muscles are weak. Okay? So what do we do? Well, if you need acetylcholine, 
we're going to use an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor and just kind of do this again. And my autocorrect keeps correcting that capital C to a lower case C. It's capital A, capital C, lower H. Um, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors mechanism of action. Okay, we block the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine, call it acetylcholinesterase, ACHE, so you have more acetylcholine. If you have more acetylcholine, it is hence cholinergic action. Okay. How do we recognize acetylcholinesterase inhibitors? Well, they're probably going to end with stigmine. Now, some of them are for other conditions, isostigmine, usually for toxicity and glaucoma, neostigmine for myasthenia gravis, pyridostigmine for myasthenia gravis. It doesn't mean that it's the only thing they're for, like neostigmine you can use as a reversal agent for pancuronium. Uh, which is a neuromuscular blocker. So again, I haven't gotten into NMBs in here, but uh, that's the kind of toxicity we can talk about. Okay. All right. Well, so we've talked a little bit about what cholinergic can do for myasthenia and how it's kind of the opposite of anticholinergic. But let's talk about the bladder control that we talked about with anticholinergic. So in anticholinergic, we had medications for an overactive bladder, okay? And that made sense, okay? So if the overactive bladder, we wanna use the urinary retention that an anticholinergic causes. But with bethanicol, you're a choline or devoid or two of the brand names, we can use the U in the sludge mnemonic that cholinergics cause urinary incontinence. It's a side effect, but for people with atonic bladder or urinary retention, it is a therapeutic effect. So again, it's a side effect for those that are taking you know, cholinergics, but if you have atonic bladder or urinary retention, it's actually a therapeutic effect, it's a relief that you can now void where you couldn't. Okay. So the mechanism of action itself is to activate those cholinergic receptors and help someone, as the brand name said, do void. So we just spell it D-O-V-O-I-D. Okay. All right. There are some considerations, though, with bethenicol and, and these cholinergic drugs. Remember ipratropium as an anticholinergic that opened up the airways? Well, if you're gonna give bethenicol and you're going to give a cholinergic, then asthma is a concern because it can constrict the airways. Okay. Uh, if we think about that bradycardia, which is the opposite of the tachycardia in bud cat, right? when you decrease heart rate, uh, you can decrease blood pressure. Decrease blood pressure, you can end up with orthostasis. Um, when you think of cholinergic, the opposite of the anticholinergic constipation, we would have diarrhea or defecation. But if you have these kind of GI issues like a peptic ulcer or intestinal obstruction, um, you could perf or perforate uh, that ulcer, which would be terrible. Or you can worsen the condition of intestinal obstruction. So imagine someone is impacted. Uh, for example, and you give them a laxative. Well, if that impaction is, uh, you know, some kind of obstruction, something's in the way, it's just going to make it worse. You're just going to make it so that you're trying to get through this wall, but it's not working. Okay. So these would be the things that I really consider, or to some extent, contraindications, asthma, orthostasis, um, that's more kind of a side effect. Um, peptic ulcers and intestinal obstruction. Disclaimer, this information is provided to you for your informational purposes only and is not intended to provide and should not be relied upon for medical or any other advice. I urge readers and listeners to consult with a medical professional with any medical condition. 
Thanks for listening to the Memorizing Pharmacology podcast. You can find episodes, cheat sheets, and more at memorizingpharm.com. Again, you can sign up for the email list at memorizingpharm.com to get your free suffixes cheat sheet or find our mobile-friendly, self-paced online pharmacology review course at residency.teachable.com forward slash p forward slash mobile. Thanks again for listening.